All right, here we are again for part two of today's lecture of ENGR 2302 Engineering Dynamics. So again, this is the second part of the lecture 15 in the series, and we're continuing with our discussion of work and energy for uh, rigid body systems. So I want to discuss, so previously we've discussed single rigid bodies, but now I want to discuss systems of rigid bodies. So systems of rigid bodies, of course, would mean multiple rigid bodies connected together in some fashion, and we would analyze the interplay and exchange of energy between the bodies in the system. So let us consider systems of rigid bodies. So systems of rigid bodies. Hmm. So for systems, the principle of work and energy can be applied to each one to each object in the system. For combinations of bodies or collections of bodies, the work energy system or work energy. Equation can be applied to in the individual bodies. Uh, to the individual bodies. That is one way to look at this. Or you can apply, or it can be applied to the entire system as a whole. Uh, to the entire system as a whole. As a whole. So, um, one, for example, I could say something like this, T1 um, plus U from 1 to 2. So a reinterpretation of the previous equation, uh, plus U from 1 to 2 equals T2 where T1 would be the uh, sum, the arithmetic sum, not the vector sum, but the arithmetic sum, the sum of the initial kinetic energies of all pieces. Uh, the initial kinetic energies of all the pieces. And then um, U from one to two uh, work on all body of, of various forces in all the bodies. Uh, work of all forces on the various bodies. Uh, on the various bodies. On the various bodies. Um, that are internal or external to the system. These can be internal or external. Um, for example, if we had a, consider something where we had a wheel and then perhaps a weight hanging from the wheel, some sort of pulley type thing, and a support there, and this thing was going to fall down, we had a spindle here, and this was wrapped around, and this thing is going to fall, and as it's released, it, it does work on this, the gravity does work on the system, and um, this thing gains, uh, I could look at the force, the internal force being tension, so it's internal to the system, but external to one of the objects. So for the first object here, the um, pulley or the, and the spindle, or the wheel and the spindle, I could have a tension force T, and even though this is an internal force, I could still consider the work done by it. So um, T here, and I could have the weight and the tension force there and look at the work done upon it or done by it. Uh, the work done there with the force T here. So we can break things into pieces um, and then look at the work components therein. And the exact methods will depend on what type of problem you're doing. And we'll see some of that. Okay. <clears throat> so 
So a couple items. A few notes on setting up problems. Uh, on setting up problems involving systems of objects, involving systems of bodies, I just have a few notes here. Oh, well, let's see. So, especially things connected by gears, pulleys, etc. Um, internal forces will occur in equal and opposite pairs. So, for example, the tension force that we saw previously. In equal and opposite pairs. Um, what next? Uh, points of application. Um, of each pair move through equal distances. So they'll move through equal distances. Next, uh, the net work, however, done by internal forces must be zero. Is zero. And the overall work on the whole system, uh, overall work on entire system, will reduce to the sum of the external, or will reduce to the work done by the external forces. So the overall work on entire system will reduce um, from an outside perspective um, to the work of external forces. So for example, in this uh, pulley and the spindle pulley and weight example, uh, here, the one of these tension forces would be doing positive work, one of them would be doing negative work, um, but together they would sum up to be zero. The only net work on this system would be done by a gravity, um, accelerating the weight, etc. Okay. Then I want to look at, um, I have a few notes on conservation of energy and uh, a, you know, a, a discussion on power, and we can move on to, looking, to look at a few um, applied examples. Okay. So let us consider conservation of work and, or conservation of energy and work. So conservation of energy. Consider for a moment conservation of energy. All right, so let us say that we have something like this here. Uh, let us look at a system of constrained motion like we have previously. And let's say initially we had a, I'm gonna draw the same kind of um, two sliders uh, connected by a rod. And I draw this a lot because it's it does readily illustrate some of the basic concepts. And initially, this thing was um, both of them were at a horizontal level, or just horizontal like this. Um, so this is B. It can slide up and down, and A can move vertically. Or sorry, uh, it can only move horizontally. So it can move side to side. And they are joined by some rod of length L. They are joined by on pivots by some rod of length L. And then again, length L, and this is my datum line. My zero elevation line. And again, this thing has length L. 
Okay, and this is our center of mass, G. All right, now, let's say this thing drops down. What if I allow B to fall? So I'm gonna draw this a bit larger than the previous one, so it's, it's still the same rod, but just stretched out a bit so I can, oh, get a few more things in there. So um, the first slider, B, will now move here. The first slider will have moved uh, to the left now, and the second slider will have moved down. And so um, they're still connected by the same pin and uh, the same rod here. The same pin and the same rod. And uh, let me label the angle, I'll call the angle of elevation now angle theta. So this thing now has an angle of theta, an angle of theta, and it has gained um, both a, the center of mass of this thing has gained both a velocity v, so this is g again, has gained some velocity v and also an omega a velocity v and an omega. However, if we go and calculate the overall drop in height of the centroid, which is what we need to consider when we're looking at this from energy considerations, this change in height would be equal to, if you run through the trigonometry, would be equal to 1 half L sine of theta. 1 half L sine of theta. And then let's consider this here. Um, so again, let me summarize this in this system. Uh, this system uh, has a mass m, uh, initial velocity zero, initial velocity zero, and um, we want to find, in this case we're asked to find, determine, oh, excuse me, I can't write there, determine uh, omega at theta. In other words, I want to know for a given angle of rotation, what will the angular velocity be? Because it makes sense that as this thing drops, it's going to get uh, more and more kinetic energy. So, and that ex part of that energy must be expressed in rotational kinetic energy. So if I want to express the, um, if I want to express the uh, work as conservation of energy, so uh, conservative forces, the work of conservative forces, and gravity is a conservative force, if we remember from previous units. Again, conservative forces means uh, fo mean forces that will not result in a net change of energy in the system. So conservative forces may transform energy into another form. They may transform it from uh, potential energy from gravitational potential energy to kinetic energy from kinetic energy to spring potential energy all of these things but energy will not be released from the system uh, typically in the form of say heat or something like that so the work of conservative forces can be thought of as t1 plus v1 is equal to t2 plus v2 where t1 is our um, would be our kinetic energy and V is our potential energy. Then for a sun, and again, this is gonna be our zero line, our datum, uh, for, sun, uh, for a slender rod, uh, of mass M, for a slender, a slender rod of mass M, well, T1 is equal to zero, and also v1 is equal to zero. Now we could define our datum down here, so but we um, I wanted to keep it here for simple just for simplistic purposes, because all we're really interested is in all we're really interested in is the omega. So this is actually going to result in this thing gaining because we're defining we are defining our zero line here, our zero uh, potential energy line here. We're actually going to have um, negative potential energy as we drop down. 
Uh, so then if two, so again, it starts off from zero, it starts off from rest, I should say. So the initial kinetic energy is zero. And because our datum line is defined at the horizontal initial level, then the initial potential energy is also zero. And so therefore, this will then collapse to uh, T2 uh, equals, um, well, I, sorry, I won't collapse to, but I do know that T2 is equal to um, 1 half M V bar squared, uh, V bar squared, uh, one ha plus one half I bar omega squared, I bar omega squared. Uh, and then I can plug in a form, I want to plug in a formula for the uh, moment of inertia of a long slender rod uh, rotated about its center, uh, rotated about its center. And this is then equal to um, here. So that's not going to change this. This is still one half. Well, actually, yeah, this will change this because I'm going to do two things. Uh, I, uh, I'm going to change the, um, I'm going to change this V to uh, LW. And then I'm also going to change, um, I'm, going to I'm going to change I here to uh, the formula for the moment of inertia of a, lar of a long slender rod. And so this becomes 1 half M. Um, and V will be equal to 1 half L, uh, 1 half L omega squared, 1 half L omega squared. So the V here the, the, is going to be equal to 1 half L omega squared. And the I uh, will be equal to, we still have our 1 half, but this is going to be 1 twelfth ML squared. Uh, 1 twelfth ML squared. Uh, times the same omega squared. And then V2, the potential energy at some point 2, is just MGH or negative 1 half uh, W L sine theta L sine theta or negative 1 half uh, MGL sine theta negative 1 half MGL sine theta and T1 plus T2 is equal to uh, T2 plus V2. Uh, T2 plus V2. And so then if I go, if I, uh, since these are both equal to zero, I can say zero if I just plug and chug. Zero is equal to one half uh, times ML squared over three. ML squared over three uh, times omega squared times omega squared, uh, just combining like terms together. So th these combine together to 1 12th ml squared over three, uh, and then minus 1 half um, MGL sine theta. And if you go and solve this for omega, you get that omega is equal to three G over L uh, times sine of theta. In other words, this thing is, if we look, if I have an M here and an M here, the mass will actually completely cancel out. This is completely independent of the mass of the system. So this will actually be completely independent of the mass of the system. Kind of interesting, according to certain definitions of interesting. Okay, uh, so next I want to move on to a, br a brief discussion of power before I moved on to some uh, numerical examples. So let us consider power. Now, of course, we know that power is the rate that work is done. Is equal to the rate that work is done. It is the rate that work is done. Now, of course, for a um, for a body acted upon by force F, so or for force F, um, and moving with the velocity V, and this comes from basic physics class, with velocity V, uh, well, the power, 
which is again equal to the rate of change of work, or du dt, is equal to f dot v. Uh, f dot v is equal to f dot v. However, but for so this is for a linear force. What about for a rotating force? Or for a rotating moment, I should say, a, ro a rotating system. Um, for a Uh, for a rotating object uh, with, velo with angular velocity omega, with angular velocity omega, and acted upon by a moment or couple m upon m by a moment or couple m. depending on how you want to perceive it. M, um, parallel to axis of rotation, to the axis of rotation of the wheel, or whatever rotating object is, of rotation of wheel, or just I should say axis of rotation. Then power will be equal to du dt. Uh, du dt, uh, which is equal to m d theta dt. m d theta dt, which is simply equal to, uh, for the case of constant moment, etc., um, m uh, omega, or at least, sorry, for the, ca for the case of constant uh, omega, will be equal to m omega. m omega. And that is a quick note on power. Okay, so next I want to work through a few uh, example problems, uh, as much as we have time for today. So, let me see here, what do I want to get through? Okay, so I think I'm first going to work on a very simple wheel and, and uh, drum problem. Drum and flywheel. Hmm. Anyone know what the purpose of a flywheel is? What? Well, on any system, what is the, generally the purpose of a flywheel? Hmm. Rotating. Keep it rotating. Okay, but mm, it's true. Okay, the purpose of a flywheel. So I will mention this is kind of interesting. What is a flywheel? Oh, what's, the obvious uh, uh, what's the obvious answer? A wheel that flies. Uh, no, a flywheel is not a wheel that flies. <laughs> It's not a wheel made of flies. It's not a wheel that's that small enough for flies or intended for flies. No, it is a, it is a, oh my God. Uh, it is a, uh, that was not a serious answer, but uh, I'm still just um, uh, face palming. Anyway, so if a flywheel, of course, is a device um, for storing kinetic energy. Um, and this can serve a variety of reasons. It, it can serve as bulk energy storage, as energy storage, or it can serve to level out, uh, to level out um, alternating forces, to level out um, the energy input from variable sources energy input or removal, input or draw from variable sources. So um, the example I can think of are, um, well, there's any number of flywheels that, there's any number of flywheels that are used in machines and uses our en they can be used in engines. Uh, but some of the neatest ones might be used for really big electrical grid storage. Now, these aren't, you know, meant to, you know, power a city for weeks or something insane like that. No, they're, they're really meant to store, you know, a fraction of a second or a second of a power plant's output, something like that. And so if you think about it, um, there are some cases of energy storage, uh, especially that is actually becoming more and more popular now with the increasing demand for renewable energy, that kind of thing. But traditionally, uh, traditionally, 
electricity has always been something that we produce exactly when needed. In other words, um, the moment you flip a light switch, uh, someone somewhere, somehow, has to generate a little bit extra electricity than they did before. It is some, electricity is very difficult to store. It is a very ephemeral power source. And so if you are going to, uh, if you are, um, if you increase the demand, uh, you need to increase the power output from the power plant. Now, uh, they ha there's a couple ways they could do this. They could have, um, they could have the power plant itself actually greatly increase and decrease its, or minutely increase and decrease its output, you know, every fraction of a second. But for your major boilers and major, you know, big steam turbines and things like that, that is not necessarily something you want to do. You, uh, those things, like the really big things, you want to keep those operating as close to a constant velocity as you can, really just to reduce the wear and tear on them, to make they, they operate most efficiently at a single, usually they'll operate most efficiently at a single rate of revolution, that kind of thing. You just want to, you know, your big uh, coal plant, your big nuclear plant, your big natural gas plant, turb well, maybe not natural gas, but definitely your big nuclear plant would be a great example. You just want to be able to fire that thing up and just let it run for months on end at a nice constant velocity. You don't have to ramp it up, ramp it down. Just keep everything humming in a constant state. That's the ideal case for minimal wear and tear on the plant. Um, however, if your plant is outputting, you're, you want your plant to be able to output this. If you think like power versus time. Power versus time. So this is what the plant's outputting. However, um, the actual demand uh, in terms, and I'm not talking like, the, uh, this might be over the course of, um, you know, one minute. Say like, uh, say this is time zero, t equals zero, t equals one minute. So I'm talking of very minute changes in time here. I'm not talking about bulk storage for an entire day. I'm talking about extremely minute, you know, second by second, fractions of a second, uh, changes in energy. So um, even then, though, the uh, power demand actually looks something like this. That you set that average, you set the constant rate of the power plant such that it's at the average over that given time. But you don't want to have to, your big boiler, you don't, imagine if you had to spin this up and spin it and make it go faster, slower, faster, slower, faster, slower, faster, slower, all day long. That's a lot of, you're accelerating and decelerating it multiple times a second, that's just, that's just dumb. I mean, well, I guess maybe not. There, there may be cases where that's done. Uh, I'm not a power plant engineer. I'm just spitballing here. But you don't want to have to do that. That's extra wear and tear. If there's a way you can avoid that, it's always a good thing. So if I'm wrong, feel free to correct me. Um, but one way, at least in certain cases, I know that power plants are able to balance this out is by using a flywheel. So instead of alternating a Instead of alternating a uh, the actual main speed, the actual speed of their main rotor, they will have a secondary flywheel instead. So you have your big main generator, your big main generator, and then it outputs energy to a flywheel. It outputs energy to my flywheel here, and the flywheel is just a great big wheel, and it's I mean, it may be the size of a small car or something. And it's in a vacuum chamber and suspended on magnetic bearings to absolutely minimize the um, to absolutely minimize the friction, and that thing just rotates, and it just rotates. And there's an electrical gen a two-way electrical generator or generator and motor combo strapped to it, and so whenever the demand decreases a bit, well, it spins up a little faster. Whenever the de demand rises a bit, it's it's it slows down a little bit. And so you keep this thing going, and basically you have a you know second or two buffer of energy storage. It's not meant to store, and these kinds of systems aren't meant to store energy over you know all day long. It's not like something you can you know have your solar plant that generates power for you know six hours a day and then stores it overnight. Um, a lot of people are investigating systems like that, but this is a more traditional energy storage that's 
only meant to hold, you know, a couple seconds worth of power. All it's meant to do is level out these tiny, minute fluctuations in demand so you don't have to... So when you turn on the light switch in your building, all it does is make the uh, flywheel uh, spin up or slow down a little tiny bit. It doesn't make... So this flywheel is a relatively pe uh, cheap piece of equipment. It's on very nice magnetic bearings. There's no, it's on, there's no kind of pressure system going on. So it's a relatively, che relatively cheap piece of equipment. It's still expensive. Um, but rel much, much, much cheaper than the, uh, than the turbine here. The turbine is designed for absolute energy efficiency, and it's designed really to operate at one constant speed for as long as possible. This thing, this thing is designed intentionally with the idea that it's going to be constantly ramping up and down, and because you're designing it for that, it will, it will uh, show better wear characteristics than something that is designed to operate at maximum efficiency but at a constant speed. Anyway, let's go to a very simple flywheel. <laughs> okay, so let's go to a much, 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 much simpler flywheel system. Uh, so we're going to look at a very simple drum and flywheel. Uh, another use of flywheels was, um, you can see it on a lot of um, old, very old uh, videos of old steam engines and pictures of old steam engines. Like um, the great big old steam engines from the 19th century for like the power factories and things like that. They would have a, it was a, you know, a primitive piston type system. And, you know, I like think 1820s, 1830s, all the way up to the 1860s, even later, um, they would have a great big piston type system. And then they would, so the piston's going to go up and down and up and down and up and down. But then you have this enormous weight that's just going to, this enormous circular, incredibly heavy wheel. And some of these things were massive. You might have, you know, flywheels three stories tall. I mean, these things were huge. And just, you know, many, 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 many tons of flywheel in certain cases. And the purpose of that was um, to, tra to store the energy of the piston as it goes up and down and up and down. And so you, um, then you're, instead of drawing your energy for whatever task you're doing directly from the piston, you drive it from the flywheel instead. Um, but anyway, it's, it's the same idea. Flywheels are all about averaging out energy. Uh, okay, so it can be very useful and efficient and et cetera, et cetera. And car engines, you can use them for, in certain cases for similar, uh, car engines have flywheels, don't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for a similar idea, right? Um, or, maybe, or is it more of a timing thing? Is it more of a t it's more of a timing thing, I guess, isn't it? Um, it's, it's for the transmission. Okay, it's for the transmission. I'm clearly not a car person. What do you want from an old civil engineer? Um, anyway, uh, so uh, let us consider something like this. So I'm going to fly. I'm going to have a drum, and from this drum, I'm going to have a. Uh, uh, from, I'm going to have a uh, rope hanging. So, so round around this drum is a cord, and there will be a 240-pound uh, weight applied. A 240-pound weight applied. And this uh, drum will have a radius of, let us say, uh, 1.25 feet. 1.25 feet. Then, at the center of this, there is a... So this drum is then... Um, bolted or welded or cast together with a flywheel. So that's kind of, I'm going to draw a very crudely rendered flywheel. Extremely crudely rendered flywheel. Wow. I should probably, probably should draw the circle first. But oh, what have I done? Okay. <laughs> My support went away. Rage quit. No, we're not rage quitting yet. It's not five o'clock yet. Okay. Yeah, this will work a little better. A lot of optical distortion in here today. So we have our uh, flywheel here. Our flywheel here. So much optical optical distortion in the room today. Uh, anyway, uh, so we have our flywheel here, and this thing is going to have a um, the whole, the overall moment of inertia of this is going to be ten point five. A uh, pound per, uh, feet per second squared, or pound feet second squared. A uh, pound feet second squared, and 
uh, I will say that the bearing friction there is friction in this bearing uh, is equivalent to a couple uh, to a 60 pound foot uh, couple a 60 pound foot couple and then uh, at some instant, at this instant, uh, the block is moving downward. A uh, block falling is falling at six feet per second. At uh, six feet per second. And I want to determine one thing. I want to determine, so all of this is given, and determine uh, the velocity of the block of block after falling another four feet. Uh, falling another four feet. Although my favorite uh, bulk energy storage solution that I've heard of before for say storing, you know, um, renewable energy and things like that is there is one particular really crazy project I'm aware of that I just love for just how, uh, for just for its sheer dumb simplicity, um, just for its sheer audaciousness and just like dumb simplicity where um, they have basically a, uh, something I've seen, uh, it's literally like a, uh, imagine if you have a, a two sets of train tracks and you put two, effectively two trains uh, train cars uh, on each set of tracks and you just f and they just fill these giant train cars these big trains up with rocks just literally rocks from the mine and then you just have a generator at the top that will either lift or lower one of these giant train cars and that's it so you just have a giant train being pulled or lowered down a mountainside full of rocks and that's your energy storage device <laughs> Um, and apparently it's useful. Apparently it has fairly high efficiencies, but I just love how stupid simple it is. It's like, you know, Tesla, Elon Musk's trying to create all these crazy batteries uh, and really cheap uh, um, lithium ion and everything else. And these guys are like, let's just roll rocks up and down a hill and call it a day. So anyway, there's your energy storage. If it works, it works. Yes. Okay. So um, let us look here. Um, here, let us consider this and draw this out, draw the system out here. So we know that the work done uh, by the um, internal forces of the cable will cancel. Uh, of the cable will cancel. So I'm not going to necessarily worry about that one. So I'm not going to worry about the work done by tension force. I'm going to consider this as a combined system um, of the internal force of tension will cancel. So instead, I'm going to look at this as a combined system here. Uh, then let us look at, all, I'm going to draw all the forces that are on this system. So I have um, my, oh, I can, why couldn't I draw it like that last time? Uh, anyway, so I have some different forces here. I'm going to draw all the forces that are on this system. And I'm going to have here, I'll have weight, W. I will have the AX and AY force, the uh, support forces, AX, AY, AY, and then I'll have this moment, which is the friction moment. That's the uh, bearing friction that we talked about previously. And I know it's going to go in this direction because it's going to be opposing the rotation caused by W, the weight here. And M is equal to 60 pound-feet. Okay. And let us say that S1, which will be position 1, is equal to 0. So I'm going to define that as my datum line. So that's my datum line. S1 is equal to 0. And then uh, here, V1 is equal to 6 feet per second, the initial velocity. And then my, uh, so then I have some, 
Also associated with this is some initial angular velocity. Uh, omega one is going to be, uh, we'll just, uh, we'll calculate that later. Oops, sorry. We'll have some initial a, uh, omega one to go with our initial F one. And then at the end, we'll have a different state. We'll have some other state. And we'll have the forces and the, su the support forces will be the same. Actually, most of the forces will be the same. Or all of the forces will be the same. AX, AY, and M equal to 60 foot-pounds, or pound-feet. Uh, 60 pound-feet. And then I'll have my weight here. Uh, so, and down here, I had my initial position, then I have my final position, some distance lower, and that distance is four feet. So S2, uh, I'll say S2 is equal to four feet, S1 is equal to zero, and the distance between them, of course, is four feet. So uh, S, that says S2 equals four feet. S2 is four feet, and we have some velocity V2, which is what we're looking to find, and we have some angular velocity omega2 associated with this. Okay? Um, so here, uh, now let's work through some of the equations here. Uh, first, I can say the, uh, I first wanna look at the relation between the angular velocity and the linear velocity, and it of course is going to be V bar equals R omega v bar equals r omega, and then I can also say, looking at the specific numbers here, that omega one is equal to, uh, omega one is going to be equal to uh, v bar one over r, uh, which is six feet per second divided by 1.25 feet, divided by 1.25 feet, uh, which equals 4.80 radians per second. 4.80 radians per second. Then omega two, the rotational velocity at, or the angular velocity at point two, or time two, is equal to V two divided by R, which is simply equal to uh, V two over 1.25. And we don't have the, uh, uh, we don't yet have V two, but we can get this relationship that will be useful later. All right, so then applying um, principles of kinetic energy or conservation of energy. So actually, maybe I'll do that on the next slide. Well, yeah, let me do that. Uh, apply conservation of energy. So if I apply conservation of energy, I will get the following. I can say that T1, of course, is equal to 1 half mv1 squared, looking at both the rotational and the linear, or, or both translational and rotational. Uh, 1 half mv1 uh, squared plus 1 half i omega squared. Plus 1 half i omega squared. And this, I'll, I will separate out the condition one, the condition two. And T2, of course, is equal to um, 1 half mv2 squared plus 1 half i omega2 squared. And this should say omega1. Sorry about that, omega1 squared. And so T1, then, is equal to um, 1 half uh, times... Okay, so let's think about this. I need to, I have the weight in pounds, and I need to convert to um, mass. So this is 240 pounds divided by 32.2 feet per second squared. Uh, feet per second squared uh, times six feet per second uh, quantity squared. The initial velocity. Uh, then plus uh, one half. So this is my, again, this is my linear kinetic energy 
and then I'll do my, this is my translational kinetic energy, and then I'll do my rotational kinetic energy initially, uh, times 10.5 uh, pound foot per second, or pound feet second, not per second, uh, pound feet second, uh, times 4.80 uh, uh, radians per second, quantity squared. Radians per second, quantity squared. And this then is equal to T1 is simply equal to 255 uh, 255 foot-pounds. 255 foot-pounds. Now working through T2, so I now have an expression for the initial total kinetic energy of the system. And I can do this, something similar for this, except done in terms of V2. So this is one half, uh, one half times the, ma the same mass, the mass is still the same, uh, 240 over 32.2 uh, times V2 squared. Oh, and this should say I omega 2 squared. Sorry about that. Um, I omega squared. And then um, plus the same 1 half times 10.5 uh, times um, the our expression for omega 2 that we had previously was V2 divided by 1.25 squared. And if you calculate all this and compress it down, I get that T2 is simply equal to 7.09 V2 squared. So whatever the, um, whatever the velocity is at point two, if I want the kinetic energy there, I just take, I just square the velocity and multiply it by 7.09. All right, so we have these two pieces of information. And then we can go further on. So next, I want to uh, relate the displacements. And this is so I can do some uh, relation to gravitational potential energy uh, and rotation. Well, theta 2 is equal to S2 divided by R. Or, uh, again, the change in angle, if we assume the initial angle is 0, um, 4 feet divided by 1.25 feet, uh, 1.25 feet, or 3.20 radians. Uh, therefore, then, uh, u from 1 to 2. So we're going to have to consider the work done by both friction, the, uh, the moment, the friction in the moment, in the pulley, or the couple that's the, the pulley friction, and the work done by gravity uh, on, the, on the weight, the hanging weight. So u from 1 to 2 is going to be then, um, it will simply be, let's see, uh, w times s2 minus s1, the weight times the, the final position minus the initial position, uh, minus m times theta 2 minus theta 1. In other words, the change in angle. And um, here, this should be a positive number because um, when I set this up, I actually defined downward as positive. And this should be positive. It, it, I come back to energy principles and I, if, when I'm worrying about the signs on this because I know that gravity should be uh, spinning the system up. It should be giving it more energy. So I'm glad that I'm making this a positive. So I'm positive that this should be positive, uh, you might say, if you were so inclined. Uh, 240 pounds times 4 feet, uh, but then the friction should be subtracting energy from the system. So minus 60 pound-feet, uh, 60 pound-feet times 3.20 radians. Uh, 3.20 radians. And the overall um, work done on the system from 1 to 2, uh, c again combining the positive work given by gravity and the negative work done by um, done by uh, friction will be 768 pound-feet, or foot-pounds. Uh, next, finally, I can look at the principle of work and energy. I'll bring it back to that. By going back to the principle of work and energy, I can say that T1 
uh, plus u from 1 to 2 um, from 1 to 2 is going to be equal to T2, so the initial kinetic energy, plus the work from 1 to 2 is going to be equal to the final kinetic energy. So 255 um, pound-feet, or feet-pounds, pounds, uh, plus 768 foot-pounds is equal to 7.09 uh, V2 squared. And from this, I can easily determine that V2 is equal to 12.01 uh, feet per second downward. Uh, feet per second downward. And that is, is how we apply um, the principle of work and energy to finding the uh, change in velocity um, over a change in position uh, for a system of joined rigid bodies. All right, I think I want to work through some later examples. Uh, I, there's still some examples I want to work through for this, but I think I will save that for next time. That'll do it for today. Uh, thank you, as always, and uh, thank you.